Okay, I've got the so when you're ready to log in, go ahead. And uh, yep. All right, let's see what we got going on here. Okay, starting to build the numbers here. Lisa, Hannah, Lane, Course, Luke, glad to see you here. And we'll get started. Um, I want to just kind of briefly go over what we had covered some last week. And the I have a couple of files here for you that I do, really, three that I want you to take a look at. <clears throat> and these were capital budgeting projects and they involved ice cold and then RMC. The RMC, I had two files I created there for you, one without setup costs and the other with setup costs. And then I have some material here just to get everybody focused back on what we're talking about when we're talking about capital budgeting. So I had some information there about capital budgeting basics, order and setup costs, and uh, had provided you some links there about careers and logistics, which are some great opportunities out there. And then Northwest Corner Method, method uh, how we use that with Solver. The, these cases, as I said before, involve capital budgeting problems. And so they're there for you to take a look at and to go back and take a look and to examine in, the, in, the, uh, in your text. If you advance anywhere in your career, whether it's starting a business or it's expanding a company, or you run a division for somebody, uh, or you have to buy a piece of equipment or anything of that nature, anything that's gonna be more of a, a commitment of a year or more is gonna involve capital budgeting. And the approach that we have here in management science does indeed work and it works well. In fact, it's pretty much how everybody does capital budgeting out in the real world. And we try to differentiate again between problem solving versus decision making. And the key uh, advantage that we have with Solver is that we can look at alternative situations. We can look at alternative scenarios and potentially alternative outcomes. And that's really what the whole course is about. And I'm gonna sound like a broken record as I said over and over, you will not have a better course in this, in this university on decision making than you'll take here. Because this, if you follow the course, it, it asks you to follow a discipline. And our speaker this morning, the mentor lecture, did a very good job of talking about that notion of a discipline, a way of doing things. And this approach says, okay, I gather data, the best data that I can get, I identify what I'm trying to accomplish. Am I trying to uh, minimize, maximize, or do I have a target value? Then I try to figure out, okay, what are the variables that I need to change? And then what are the constraints under which I operate? And use the solver as a means to try to generate what will be the potential likely outcomes of what we get done. Now, I think the the, the material I've got there for you is, is most certainly uh, of some good value for you. And well, I know it is, or I wouldn't have included it. And again, this is a process by where we, by which we follow, uh, by which we make decisions. And it's a disciplined process. And as, and, and we, as you'll see each, each week as we go through this, the bottom line is here's a series of steps that I follow to make decisions. And by doing that, we are able to narrow down the potential uncertainty or risk that's involved with these business operations, especially making capital budgeting decisions. And these are decisions that could uh, have a long-term positive or negative impact on a company. So I, I have those, I have that information there for you. Now, as I said before, I don't give you points or take points away for you uh, for looking at these materials that I've got over here. And I'll just use a little annotator here for a second. Okay. Um, this stuff right here, as far as what we did with the, with 
the uh, and ice cold explain. These are things that are there for you to take a look at and to learn from, okay? And to see how we use the tool, how we apply it. Then of course I have these other resources here that help you review some on capital budgeting. Talk about this issue of order versus setup order versus setup costs. And this is reminiscent of the case that you had if you took 1123 with me where we looked at that company that was trying to come up, was trying to, was utilizing, pardon me, the economic order quantity. And then of course the Northwest Corner method, uh, it, and then some things that I think are good for you in terms of career stuff, jobs and logistics, supply chain. There are great, 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 great opportunities out there for folks if you want to pursue them. And not only are there job opportunities, the opportunities are there for advancement and there to make a pretty good living. So I would encourage you to take a look at those. Well, let me uh, pull the eraser off and I don't want to pontificate too much about those. I hope uh, some of you went to the mentor lecture. If you didn't, you missed it. You missed a good experience. And I think you learned something very important if you read the, if you, if you read the, uh, the gentleman's background. What you saw was that within the one particular organization, he f wore many, many, many hats. And that was a flexibility that probably uh, for the folks above made him someone who is not only employable, but someone who is promotable. Because wearing those different hats through the years and being willing to go where he needed to go was what set him apart from so many people who allowed those hardships and things to discourage him. And he had also an important piece in this, and it was this. Uh, his wife, who is an absolute, absolute gem, wonderful person, he had a partner in his career with him. And the, other than, I would say this, other than, other than decision that you make in terms of how you relate to the Lord, okay, the second most important thing you will ever do in your entire life is the choice of a spouse. And I hope that you take that choice seriously. I understand when you're young that sometimes the hormonals uh, factor can really kick in and go. But you have to find out, is this person someone who is my friend and would be my friend for the rest of my life and would be supportive and whom I could support as you found, uh, as you lived your lives together. And that's a couple, I can tell you that military families have a pretty high rate of divorce because of the separation, because of the hardships. Um, Living on base is no picnic, even if you're a high, pretty high ranking, until you hit maybe a high ranking officer level, like a colonel, like a major, maybe a lieutenant colonel. You don't live in the nicest of homes uh, if you live on base, if you're lucky enough to get to live on base. Otherwise, you're out in an apartment, usually, or renting a house. And so the, the, that's, there's, there were some great lessons just in that couple and how they related and and how they shared as partners what they're doing. Well, that's some, uh, that's some information that you really didn't come here to hear today, but let's just go quickly through what's going on next uh, on the 11th, which is Friday. You've got chapters nine and 10 in Anderson, and then you've got the Martin Beck case, okay? And the file is over there in the chapter seven files, all right? And I'm not gonna ask you to do anything with that. I'm just gonna ask you to take a look at the case and upload the file. All right, and then uh, I'll I will uh, show you uh, some of the highlights or key points. But let's look at the narrative of that case first of all. And again, here we are. We're dealing with one of these what we call transportation or distribution problems. And this is a company, Martin Beck. Okay, and they want to increase their capacity by building a new plant, and they've got some choices or options for where they want to build their new plant. <laughs> now, I'm kind of laughing for a simple reason. Back in graduate school, one of my masters was in operations, and I, we had a course on nothing but facility location. Why and how do you locate a facility somewhere? What would be the rationale? And I took the course, and let me say, it was not for the faint of heart. 
And it was, for many, it was a, a very dry experience. But for those of us, uh, well, for all of us, it, it really wasn't. We were in there for a reason. And we'd chosen that path. So it, it had to be something that we were interested in. But of course, there were those who had interests in operations other than just facility location. I did primarily because my father had worked in that field for such a long time. And because over the years, I'm just, I've always been a geography nut. So I was interested in how do we figure out where to locate a, locate a facility. At the end of the course, which was extremely uh, tough, uh, our prof would start, and by the end of the uh, end of the end of the session, we were hanging on by our fingernails. Uh, he said, uh, after all of the models and all the approaches, uh, approaches and pardon me, all the techniques that we were we learned, he said, you're going to learn very. And here's here's a piece for all of this to keep in mind. And we all, of course, were sitting there thinking, all right. He said, the location will be put where somebody on the board or the owner wants to put it. So sometimes these rational, these, these attempts we have at rationalizing uh, or optimizing things can go for naught because someone just because of a personal preference or choice decides, no, I'm going to do it this way. And that will be one of the great frustrations of your career. Whether you hate this course or you love this course, you're just indifferent to it and you want to get through it, I can tell you that you're going to deal with, let me say this, you're going to work in many situations where the best thing you can do is accept this, accept this truth. You're being logical. <laughs> I don't know how many times I had people tell me, you're being logical. Stop being logical. So we can have these approaches and use them but if a company doesn't have or, or, or use the discipline to apply them and apply them as effectively as they can, that's why you know, the Fortune 500 gets turned over about every 25 years. Those companies that are good at, at using the tools they have and staying on top of them are. Well, we've got this situation here and we've got this company, Martin Beck, and they're trying to figure out where they want to put a proposed plant. Okay, and they've got here are the list of candidates. Okay. And notice two things right off the bat the amount of fixed cost built in and the amount of capacity. Now, what this should tell you is that in to looking at these plants where we're where we're gonna the location. We're looking at fixed, we're, 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 taking, we're taking the approach from a total cost perspective. You say, well, Dr. Harmon, how do you know that? Well, simple. First of all, I have the amount of fixed cost, okay? The second thing is capacity. And the amount of capacity implies the variable costs associated with each plant. As you recall, total cost equals fixed cost plus variable costs, variable costs equal what? The change in costs due to changes in the level of production. So the total cost, which we started off way back in six weeks ago, uh, when we did the Nolan, I think it was the Nolan case, and, and we had that, and we had that, that we used the goal seek and we looked at the total cost equation. And if you've had 1123 with me, you remember we went back and we had that company, what were they selling? Uh, jams. And we used the total cost equation technique to figure out what's the break even point for, in terms of, of revenue, what's the break even point in terms of volume, what was the economic risk there, the owner, what they were putting in, et cetera. So we're right back to that fundamental. The, the business, and I think, I, I think our speaker this morning really gave us a fantastic presentation, I, especially when he talked about being a Chick-fil-A owner operator. Listen, it takes a lot of work to run one of those and to be successful. They just don't, they're not successful. And I thought it was interesting when he talked about, they went back to their basics 101 how, how, how to make sure that that sandwich, their sandwiches, taste like they should. 
that's a quality control issue. And understanding that there has to be discipline with that. It's the same thing in terms of this situation where we're saying, I have a mental model, I have an approach, I have a game plan. Whatever you want to, whatever term works best for you, okay, is what we're doing here in this case. And so as I continue to show you time after time and situation after situation, this course is not about how to use Excel Solver. This course is about how to become a good decision maker using a tool that lets me look at potential outcomes. And you've heard me say it again, we're always talking about outcomes that can range from very, very good to very, very bad to pretty much what we'd expect. So you can see we've got the annual capacity here for these, the amount of fixed costs, all right? And we'll scroll on down here. Now, well, I'm gonna go ahead and erase this first. And we're working with the total cost equation. All right. And we're gonna come over here and we're gonna scroll down and they have a long range planning group most larger companies will have a formal long range or capital budgeting group. If you work for a small company, the capital budget group will, or long range plan group will, will typically be the entrepreneur and all the investors uh, and, um, or the key investors and any uh, key department or executives in that company. So this firm has a long range planning group and they're building some forecasts, okay? And so they have some forecasts for, the, for their annual demand of each of their centers, okay? They've got these three centers and here's what they think will be the annual, an, annual demand. So they're trying to say, okay, we want to add a, we want to add a new facility and we, have to, and we have to mesh it in with the current facilities that we have. And we've got a forecast. Now, at the end of this course, I'm gonna have you do a project in forecasting. I don't know how much, if any at all, that you did, probably none in statistics. I don't know if, you, if you're for marketing course, if you do any forecasting or you work with forecast models, goodness, I hope you do. If not, you'll want to really put, sink your teeth into the chapters here that deal with forecasting because that is absolutely positively essential for you. And here we see these distribution centers and their annual demand. And so they've got to try and figure out, all right, how do we mesh in one of these candidates with the current distribution centers that we have? And so we now have this distribution design problem, okay? We wanna bring on the right amount of capacity and the right amount of fixed costs because remember something, if these, comp if these, if these proposed facilities have an annual fixed cost, all right, then you can bet your bottom dollar we have fixed costs here in these distribution, in, in, the, in the current distribution centers. So we start, to, we start to go back and we work with that binary choice of a one or a zero, okay, go or no go, and we have our options. And the options are if a plant is constructed in Detroit, Toledo, Denver, so we've got Y1 through Y4, okay? And we've got our choice, a zero or a one. It's a go or it's a no-go, all right? And if you, if, you, um, if, you, if, you, if you attended the lecture this morning um, with the, our speaker, when he, when he talked about the, 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 the forward bases, 
um, they go through this kind of mental gymnastic in their heads every day uh, before they launch out to do some work or do some planning for someone, for, for a larger force to come in. And in that situation, you're dealing with life and death matters. So he didn't, he certainly didn't go into the details and, and wouldn't be able to, to tell you exactly the process they go through, but they do have a process they follow. And once they've done it so many times, it's almost like on the back of an envelope for them. And some of it also is, 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 is it's, some of it's rational on the basis of whatever intelligence they might have. And they do have pretty good capabilities, but the other is it's, it's, it's more of an experience and a feeling. I don't know how else to tell you that. And you'll encounter this when you come into business and you have to try to make one of these decisions. So here we see the shipping cost per unit for the system, okay? And there are the distribution centers, okay? And you can see these distribution centers that we've got and what the cost is from one point to the other, okay? And notice that we've built in uh, Kansas City. We've built in each of them. And so we have that matrix there that we've developed that shows us the cost per unit in our distribution center. So what does it cost to get it from one place to the other? Now over here, in, in this, over here, you'll see the following. We see the capacity of each of those plants, all right? And we're back, we're using a network model. The circle is a node. It's either an origin or a destination or a, I guess I would call it an intermediate destination. It's between two points. This is a simple network diagram they show us here. So we have the point of origin and we have the plant capacities. Then we have the distribution routes, okay? And the cost to send stuff from, from Detroit to Boston. And you can see the distribution nodes run from plant one over to, to the distribution center. So what's going on here is these folks make stuff or components of things and they send it to a place to be distributed, maybe to a finishing assembler is what we would call. And I'll just throw this out here for a minute. We may have a, a what we would call a finishing assembler. That's the ones who do the final assembly. And then they, then they may either distribute the product themselves to the end user or they may send it to another distribution center. It just depends on how complex the product is. The authors have dumbed this down for us to the extent so we can kind of see how that all works, okay? So then we're looking at the destination nodes and these lines are arcs. That's the term that we use for network. And so we have the origin and the arc and then the destination and we can see the demand at each of these. So the idea is to balance off capacity with demand at the lowest cost. And that, and that if we're smart, we'll use an optimization process to do that. Now let me stop for a minute and talk about some of the realities, okay? One of the things that, that one of the things that's good for you is I've been out here and dealt with this stuff. So I can tell you if the textbook is about 90% right in terms of how all this falls together. <laughs> the problem is the other 10% is the stuff that goes bump in the middle of the night. That you have to be prepared for that it won't exactly work out like you should or you think it should, okay? But if you see the model and you work from the model and use a disciplined approach, it's gonna work. This is no different. I'm use a sports analogy. If you have a if you ha if you have a football team or a basketball team and they have a play and they practice that play for a given situation over and over and over, 
then it becomes a question of execution. Sometimes the conditions will change, things will happen. And so you're gonna encounter that out in business. You're gonna be all prepped and ready to go on a big project like this and then suddenly one of the key people that work for you takes a job elsewhere. Or suddenly, as you get into the middle of this, one of the two or three key people working for you are starting to have marital difficulties or maybe they have a health problem. That's the stuff you have to be fluid or, or ready to try to do any changing if you have to. And the distribution routes, if you're so okay, the capacities, are, what, what here Dr. Harmon is really set in stone? Well, really nothing, but the stuff that's the most certain, okay, and this is just some operating wisdom, uh, having been dealt, dealt with this junk, is the capacities, you need to make sure that you understand that when you talk about the capacity, that we're taught, you talk about the real capacity, not the capacity on paper. And I'll take you back to the example of this computer lab. This computer lab, okay, can, has, I think, 42 or 43 computers. That's the capacity on paper. The reality is this, three to five of them on any given day won't be working. So the actual capacity is about 38 to 40. Can I predict that? I can take a guess, but there will be those days when some of these machines just simply are not working. It's the same with the, those situations where the network doesn't work or whatever. But these capacities over here should be as close as you can get to actual capacities. All right? Now, We'll move this up for a second. And here are the plants. We have the capacities. And then we have these distribution routes. And attached to each of those, or implied by each of those, are these numbers. And here they are, the cost per unit. To ship one thing from one place to another. So if I look at, if I look at ARC 1-1, that is Detroit to Boston, it's five units, okay? That's the cost, and five bucks, if you wanna call that, 50 bucks, it's five units, and then I have, on top of that, this question of demands. Now, from my, from one of my course evaluations last semester, I had a student who wrote, he does, he shows us this stuff, but he rattles on and rattles on. Let me give you a piece of news. If I've been out here and worked with this stuff before, then maybe you ought to have your eyes and ears open because I might save your skin at some point. There is value to experience. And the reason that we give you these models is to try and say, okay, here's what we understand about what you're gonna encounter. And then I try to give you some thoughts in terms of here's what you, stuff that goes bump in the night, the things that happen out there in practice that you may not anticipate, okay? This would be no different than, let's say you're, a, you're, you're studying to be an eye surgeon and you, and, you, and you go through all the protocols and you learn all the steps and you memorize that stuff and you know it cold. You don't go in there and wing it. And then you're in the middle and let's even if you've been, let's say you've been out in practice for a few years and you're in the middle of, of, of an operation and suddenly you find out that the surgical nurse didn't include all the, the equipment you need or something happens with a respirator or the power goes out. What are you going to do? Doctors encounter those things all of the time, just like business people do. So you have to be thinking about that and say, okay, what would be my contingency if, for example, these forecasted demands were not what I thought they would be? And the great value of solver and the great value of the tool is I can work through those constraints, work through those decision variables, and go from there, okay? Now, I know I'm doing a lot of lecturing here, right? I understand that. 
And if you're lucky, <clears throat> your company will have somebody who does nothing but this. That's all they do, logistics. Maybe they're your, your vendors. If you're, if you're smart, uh, yeah, use FedEx, use UPS. The post office has a pretty good outfit, but those two, FedEx and UPS, they have internal people who will work with you, who will help you through these kinds of problems. This is no different than if you gotta go to court, take a lawyer, don't go and, don't, don't go and represent yourself. So we have this problem here, and so we're gonna come down and we're gonna to start to build our model, okay? And I'll come back to the annotation here and I'll get my eraser and I'll get this stuff off so we can see it nicely, et cetera. I will come down here and to the variables. And so we see the units shipped in thousands from plant, from plant I to distribution center J. And we've got I is one, two, three, four, five, and J is one, two, three. And that's how we begin to build the models. There is X11, and that's from uh, origin one to destination one. Then we see uh, origin uh, one to destination two, and they're weighted based upon the routes. Now, talk for a moment about the dist distribution routes. I said before, if, you don't, if you're not a very large company and you have internal specialists to do this, hire professionals, bring them in. There, today, the, the, the kinds of tools that people have out there, let me put it like this. If you say you have a marketing uh, manager and you say maybe you're in a large enough company, you have an assi assistant marketing manager, it's going to cost you a whole lot more money and time to train either one of those to use the tools that are out there and the really sophisticated tools as opposed to just hiring somebody to come in. So there are going to be a lot of situations where you're going to want to come in and you'll have to pay some additional money. And so this will have to be factored into the project too is what do we have to spend to have them figure out the distribution routes. I'll give you a real simple example. This morning I had to, I had to be here in Shawnee in time for the mentor lecture and it, because it starts at 10. So I had to, I used to get here 10, 15, 10, 30, then I had class 11. So I had to back myself up an hour. And as I'm, as I'm headed out, I'm always taking a look at I-35 to see what's going on over there. And sure enough, there had been a wreck. If I had not known my way around to find some alternative routes to get me over to, to, four, to 240, to come on in on 40, I would have been late, okay? So I understood the traffic pattern and what was going on. So it's the same issue in terms of some of these distribution, of the distribution routes. You'll, you'll wanna make sure if you're involved in this kind of thing that you really do understand the values attached to those routes and that they're as accurate as they can possibly be because I can tell you, all you have to do to create a real problem for yourself is to ignore changes in, in, in construction and that type of thing. Well, we've, we've, we build our shipping cost data, okay? And we put it into a mathematical formula. And the beauty of this mathematical model is I have the destination node and I have the I have, pardon me, the, the origin node and the destination node. And then it doesn't matter if one one is 5X, 10X, 12X, whatever. I, the key part is I have X11, X, X12, X13, X21, blah, blah, blah. Okay? That's the underlying model. Those are the constants, i.e. the nodes. I just plug the numbers in on top of them. Okay, now here we build in the annual fixed costs for the plants of the new plant, okay? And we got the Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4. And the beauty of the model again is Y is the new plant, 
and I have four choices. You say, well, Dr. Howard, why couldn't I have 10? You could have 10, you could have six, you could have seven. Let me stop for a moment and say this. Before you've ever gotten to this place, okay, this place, your, your new plants, the proposed plants, you have done a feasibility study to determine if those are even locations that are worth proposing and even thinking about. And in capital budgeting, that's what we call a sunk cost. You've done a study and whether you do the project or not, you've spent the money. Now, hopefully you'll recapture the funds you spent on this and later on in, in the course we're going to look at the expected value what we call the EVPI the expected value of perfect information now here we see the Detroit capacity the Toledo cast capacity and as you can see here on 235 okay we're starting to build in these constraints how do I know because I can see the boolean operator there for Detroit Toledo St. Louis, Boston, and here is my statement. Now, you say, all righty. You've talked about this being a dis disciplined process. Explain how it is here. Let's talk about that for a minute. We want to minimize our costs. Yada, yada, yada. Whoopee, boy, we're geniuses. <laughs> I want to minimize my costs. I'm a real genius. Trust me, there are a lot of people out in business who operate who don't even have the brains to say. And they're good people. And I'm not even going to say the brains. They don't have the training or understanding. Let me stop for a moment. There are few people in the world who can intuitively start a business and run it, and run it successfully. The rest of us go to school, okay? My parents were entrepreneurs. They were both very successful. I didn't get that deep gene. I didn't. I had to go to school to learn how to run a business. I remember my father saying, Jack, you really have to take all those courses. I didn't have to do all that. And I wanted to say, well, you know, it's a more complicated world, but in some ways it was, in some ways it wasn't. And I recalled one night that, uh, he said, well, I was in grad school, and I said, oh, I'll tell you what, let me do some forecasting of your inventory, and let's just see. And so I, I, did, I issued my father a challenge. I said, let's see who can do forecasting of your inventory better. So I poured through all of his inventory, purchase records, et cetera. I took some models I just learned from school. I put the models together. I presented them to him, okay? And then we went back and compared to see how many stockouts had occurred? How many times had he ordered inventory and had there, was there a stockout? There was one single time he had a stockout. Mine was littered with one stockout after the other and he looked at me and said, if I'd followed what you did, I would have run my business in the ground. And it was at that point I realized I didn't get the gene from him, okay? He had that, he had the brains to do that. It's just how he was. He could play any instrument. I never got that gene either. I remember watching him one time, he picked up a, heard a song and picked up a saxophone. Played a saxophone, never played in his life. I'm going, why didn't I get that gene? Well, I didn't. So like the rest of us, I had to go study and learn my craft. Well, here we're gonna do a minimization, but you know, I'd have another op option. And that would be to say, okay, I'm in a capital budgeting, and I want to set up a target value. So when you go in and you look at Solver there, the Martin Beck over in Chapter 7 files, take a look and remember, I've got three choices. I'm maximization, minimization, or target value. You say, so Dr. Harmon, could I try to achieve a target value if I was in capital rationing? Absolutely. But in this case, we're going to do it the easy way and just say, let's minimize it and get it as, and see how low it is. That saves us a step of trying to figure out what we would like a target value because you know, we're gonna to try to find the best theoretical response we can get here. Okay, now we have our model 
And again, let me get this, uh, that's bugging me there. I get that little bit right there, there we go. We have our model, right? And it's laid out in this nice mathematical model that we have. Here's the objective function, right? And the ST means subject to, and then we have the capacities. And we have a mixed bag of capacities. If you look at the Boolean operators, you'll see. We have some equivalencies. We have some greater than or equal to and some lesser than or equal to. And then we come down here to the kicker where we really have a mixed bag where x, y is greater than, uh, greater than or equal to zero for all. And then for each of these, we're making our binary choice. It has to be a zero or a one. It's a go or it's a no go. The thing that's always amazing to me, and you'll hear me say this over and over and over, is that so much of this is really not that difficult. This is a thought process. The software just enables us to put it into a mathematical model. In the old days, you sat down and you wrote a bunch of computer programs, you ran them. In the old days, you might say, okay, let's do some alpha, alpha beta tests. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Alpha beta tests would be, we say, okay, we're gonna go into one of these proposed locations and we're gonna set up a, 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 we're gonna model capacity. We're gonna build, a, not a full scale model, but a, but, but a model, okay? And then we're just gonna see if it works. We're gonna actually put it into the distribution system and see what happens, okay? And that involved some serious sunk costs because you're actually doing it to see if it'll work on the grander scale. But the beauty of this is I have it here in mathematics. I can change these very, I can change these capacities. If I want to, I can change the Boolean operators in the direction I need them to. That's the beauty of this. And I'm gonna tell you that's the beauty of it for a simple reason. Every one of you has flown somewhere and made it, flown from one part of planet Earth and gone to another. You had stuff delivered to your house on time. You went to a restaurant and the food was delivered. You ordered a prescription and it was ready. It was filled correctly. You went into Walmart, you could find the stuff and the stuff that comes from all over the world. The, Good Lord has blessed us with these marvelous tools. These are a reflection of him and his incredible, incredible genius for creation, for understanding. And I think other than natural science, when you get into some of these and you look at the mathematics, especially management science, where we really apply just simplistic mathematics, it's an amazing thing and to think that this, is, this stuff really truly works. Now, unfortunately, most of this is grounded in the experiences of warfare, where we had to get people and stuff places, and we learned lessons from those. But God in his wisdom provided us a way to, for uh, some smart people to sit back and say, you know, we ought to use this stuff in business. Because in 2020, they're going to be doing business all over the world. And here we are. Think about it when the power goes out. How inconvenient that is. Or customer service issues. Our, our speaker talked about those today. Well, I'm not going to wax on too much more poetically. But I want to say this. I hope that as you look at this and you see this model, Okay, you see that for a fraction of the cost of actually just trying it, we can approximate what might be the reality 
we want to try to create. Okay? It's no different than people that build buildings. Uh, other than distribution systems, to me, the most fascinating things in the face of planet Earth are these incredible skyscrapers that they're building. The materials and their ability to take them further and further and further is just, it's unreal. It's unbelievable to me. And they're so beautiful. I, when I, my wife and I were in Europe this summer and we, we went to the financial district in London. I hadn't been there in a long time. They're on the River Thames and, and, and then over the, the, the skyscrapers, they're incredible. They're so beautiful. They're just off the charts. And it reinforced for me that as business people, math is our friend. It's your friend. Now I know <laughs> you've had stat and calculus. I know you're going, eh, eh, ain't my friend. I, I feel your pain. But when we move down to these, to this level and we try and we build a mathematical model like this, this is an incredible thing that enables us to look at reality and try to build a reality that will fit what we need for our customers and for our business and to grow. So I'm going to finish this up on, on Wednesday. I do appreciate those of you who are here. We got four more of us than, than nine uh, who are enrolled in this class. And I want to say this, I, I, I keep an, and, and do a report on attendance and and I take a look at that on a pretty consistent basis. And while I don't give points for participation or attendance, if somebody comes to a point where they're borderline, and I see that they've, they've, missed, they've missed classes, and I do have a way to track logins and attendance, um, and you haven't participated, then you know, uh, I have to say, you know, I'm not sure I would round up because you've shown that you really weren't too enthused about increase in building your craft. And I understand for some of you, math is a scary thing. It was for me, but if you slow it down and which I hopefully have done here and really take a look at this, read the case narrative. Don't let the notation fool you. You're going to find that this is a beautiful case that shows us a great way. Think of this as Martin Beck company and not distribution. But think of this as a situation if you had to plan to deal with a humanitarian disaster that you have a million refugees on your shore and you've got to get to them or you have the people in Puerto Rico or the people down in Florida or the earthquake in Mexico or the tsunami in Japan and you've got to get in there and help those people. These are the kinds of skills if you really want to do some meaningful things that you can do. On the same token, you can do some great and meaningful things if you provide people a nice sandwich to eat. There's some, a lot to be said in that. And our Lord, what did he do? He shared with his disciples a meal. And that's when he truly reviewed, revealed who he was at a meal. It's called the Last Supper. What a simple thing, but our Lord demonstrated that even in the simplest things, that we can exhibit his grace and love. Thank you so much, folks. Appreciate it. God bless you. And I'll uh, see you on Wednesday. Anybody have a question? If you do, you're out of luck. No, I'll answer. Any questions? All right. Thanks much.